It's Thursday, May 18th, and oh man, it's a very, I can call it minorly sentimental day for the podcast, as it's my very last show from L.A., uh, while my life is being packed away in boxes, trying to get furniture up out of the house, uh, been dealing with way too many people on Facebook Marketplace than I've ever wanted to in my entire life. <laughs> you know, my wife, Charlie, Peach, and I, we're about to begin our new journey in a new city. I figure today is a great uh, time to kind of do a special episode of the podcast where we're going to highlight some NFL players, NFL people about to do the same thing. We're calling it our Fresh Start and New Beginnings podcast, and I could think of no better co-host for this very special episode than a man who is in a seemingly new place every single episode podcasting (laughs) from one of his very many palatial estates. It's the one and only Andy Behrens. What's going on, buddy? Let me first say this uh, is a wonderful idea for a podcast. Uh, I I really like the concept. Sometimes it's difficult to come up with these off-season topics, especially when we're not like in the run-up to draft season, camps aren't about to open, anything like that. So I think this is a great idea. I I am curious, are are you and your wife, are you like compatible movers and packers? Um, So, you know, that that can be a that can be a source of friction. Uh, But uh, oftentimes when my wife and I have moved in the past, her her job seems to be to sort through her old magazines that end up moving with us. And my job is to pack all of the other things. Uh, yeah, I think we're pretty compatible in, in a lot of ways. I will say shout out to her mom. Actually, my mother-in-law has been great about like, Hey, if you just want me to come over and like pack, pack, um, you know, cause we, this has kind of been a slow burn, you know, we move across the country. It's not like happening a couple of days before. Right. So, uh, yeah. she's been great about coming over and like packing our glasses, which we have way too many of, you know, we have to have like a wine glass for every type of wine, champagne, you know, glasses that you're never going to drink out of old family glasses. And, you know, we also made the mistake of moving a year after we got married. So we have like an excess of things off of our registry. She's been great about that. I will say my wife is, is very, I, I'm actually weirdly uh, like Brie is not as sentimental as it, about stuff. I'm like, Ooh, but like this thing that I used once in the last three years, like we should maybe take that. <laughs> Meanwhile, she's pretty cutthroat where it's like, if I haven't seen it in four months, throw it out. I don't care about it. Give it away. Oh, whatever. So awesome. we are, that is actually very helpful. That's, that's excellent. Um, I, I'd forgotten that you guys are like, you guys aren't that far removed from the wedding. So you've got like, you haven't broken that many glasses yet, right? You haven't realized the things that you, you haven't yet used that, um, absolutely don't need to travel with you. And, <laughs> yeah, uh, no. yeah, I mean, I can't even think of the number of things. I, I don't know. I probably shouldn't even talk about the number of things that like, you know, didn't make it from our first apartment to our second apartment because we realized, <laughs> oh, wow, we're n- we're not getting any use out of this thing that we registered for and never will. Yeah, well, it's a great time to get rid of furniture. Like I said, that's the thing that's a bit been the big one because it's like a lot of this stuff is stuff from my old apartment and her old place, like just jumbled together. So that yeah. means she hates 99% of it. So we're just like, get, especially <laughs> anything that used to be mine. Uh, she's she's like, just get like we got rid of our dining room table yesterday and I felt like it was it was a new ground in our relationship because she hated that dining room table so much. It was also, she's like, this is made for giants. I'm like, no, this is made for normal size people. I'm above normal size and you're <laughs> below normal size. So that's the problem. There. So yeah, we're, we're figuring out, man, it's, it's going to be fine. Good. Um, so we, we are excited. We're excited about this podcast episode for sure. A little piece of housekeeping before we get into it, since I am going to be driving across the country, uh, and I will not be podcasting from my truck. I am not going to be on the show <laughs> next week. Uh, we're, we're going to do actually just one show a week, the next two weeks, but more on that at the end of the episode, I'll give you kind of the heads up on that. But Andy, before we get into our main topic today, uh, we do have one quick quote news item that I wanted to discuss. Uh, you know, speaking of new adventures, Matt Ryan, you'll remember him famously as the Colts quarterback. That's definitely how he'll go down in history. Uh, Matt (laughs) Ryan this week announced that he will be joining CBS sports this fall. He's sort of pulling a Tony Romo where he's like, this is not a formal retirement announcement, but like, buddy, once you're in your late thirties and you're in a suit, you're on TV, you're retired. Um, But I kind of wanted to talk about this group of quarterbacks, Andy, because I thought uh, Seth Wickersham of ESPN alluded to it in a profile that he just did on Matt Ryan is, is kind of like the quote 98th percentile cluster of quarterbacks, you know, the ones that 
like Ryan, you know, had these great moments. I mean, at different times, I think Matt Ryan was, you know, a fringe top five quarterback in the NFL. He was, he won an MVP. Uh, Obviously, as Wickersham said in the profile, he was, you know, moments away from becoming one of the 99th ones that wins a Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. Um, Andy, I like, there's something tragic about this group of guys to me because, you know, they're a real, like, I'll go down remembering Matt Ryan and I think Philip Rivers is a great example because when we talk about like Ryan, at least he didn't win a Super Bowl, but he went to a Super Bowl. Philip Rivers never went to a Super Bowl. Aaron Rodgers is still playing, but he's been to one and he's won one. And these guys to me end up being a reminder of like, dude, this is really freaking hard to win a Super Bowl, no matter how great you are at the quarterback position. Yeah, it's really hard. And you're also overlapping the careers of Tom Brady and Patrick Mahomes, right? So right. You, you've got you've got these people who are barring the door to to the Super Bowl in this in this era. And it's just, you know, you think of some of the guys that have broken through. Nick Foles broke through, right? Like there's no rhyme or reason to it. Matthew Stafford broke through. Does that mean Joe Matthew Flacco? Stafford? Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's like it's, it's hard to make sense of it. It feels like in a, in a, a more just version of the NFL, Matt Ryan would have broken through and gotten one. Like Matt Ryan's had an awesome career and there was a moment, um, Scott Pianowski can attest to this. I remember having the conversation with him. Like this is like second year of Matt Ryan's career. Right. And he's shown all kinds of promise as a, as a rookie quarterback at a, you know, at a, at a level when we, you know, certainly at a time when we didn't expect rookie quarterbacks to do anything, Cam Newton hadn't happened mm-hmm. yet. Right. But I, I remember Scott and I having a conversation where like, if we were right now, second year, Matt Ryan, if we were to redraft the NFL from scratch, maybe he's the first overall pick, right? Like who wouldn't take the next 15 years of Matt Ryan's career? It's going to be awesome. Um, and, it, and it was awesome. I think he's going to be a great announcer. Um, I, I think he's like that. You talk, I, you know, but forget like all the stats and everything he's accomplished throughout his career as a player. Um, I, se- seems like seems like a really good guy um, off off the field. Seems like he's he's always, you know, he's he's been a guy who answers all the questions. Good with fans good with teammates. Haven't really heard a negative word about Matt Ryan. I think he's going to be great at this job. I think he's going to be the kind of announcer that you can learn things from. So I, I think it's a nice next chapter of his career. H- hopefully nobody remembers the the brief stint in Indianapolis. And we remember him as a rocket armed, um, re- really, really exciting quarterback. Like his, I mean, his best years, Julio, Roddy, Matt Ryan, let's go. Like that was a, that was a fun team. And, and he was a fun player. It, it is unfortunate that uh, he uh, the year with the Colts, whatever. I mean, look, I'm I'm actually in the middle of charting Matt Pitt, Michael Pittman for for reception perception. Uh, I'm trying to forget that era of of Colts football. I think once I'm done with this, I'll officially blast it out of my memory forever. But the harder thing with Ryan is just the twenty eight to three. You know, he's the butt of that joke. Uh, obviously, that that will be a thing that he is remembered for. But yeah, man, I I think it's interesting because, like you said, it's a great point that if you said, you know, we just had three quarterbacks go in the top five picks. If you said to Colt, you know, Colts fans, again, ironically, Colts fans, Panthers fans, Texans fans, like, do you, you will, would you take Matt Ryan's career for any of these guys? I think at first they'd be like, <laughs> no, I want, you know, I want them to win multiple Super Bowls. I want them to, you know, consistently, I mean, those Falcons teams were really good and consistently competitive, but, you know, again, consistently participating in Super Bowls, that's just so unrealistic. You know, Ryan had a great career. It's just, it is unfortunate that, you know, you go through the last few years of Super Bowl quarterbacks and it's like Brady, 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 Manning, 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 occasionally, but Brady, 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 for the most part, Roethlisberger got in there a couple of times. And then now it's just Mahomes, 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 Mahomes. It's like these two Titans of the game in like, Oh, just completely overlapping. They literally played each other in one of those games. So that's going to be difficult to break through that wall, but it's, Andy, it does feel like we're in a kind of, I don't know if I want to say like golden age of young quarterbacks, but pretty close. I mean, we just Mahomes, obviously, but like there's a ton of guys right now that have mostly in the AFC that haven't even come close to, to, but one of, one of them, Joe Burrow has been in a Super Bowl, but like Josh Allen hasn't been in a Super Bowl, Trevor Lawrence, you know, Justin Herbert, uh, Tua, like there's a great amount of young quarterbacks right now, Lamar Jackson in the AFC. And it's tough knowing that like, Maybe one of them, maybe one of them wins a Super Bowl. You know, Joe Burrow went in his second year, but 
these guys don't get back that often. Like I've heard Philip Rivers, uh, you know, North Turner told him like, don't worry, you know, you'll be back here plenty of times when it was like an A, I think it was an AFC championship game or something like that. And they never got over that hump. Like he was so young, but they never got over that hump. So it's kind of sad to know. And like, I'm kind of curious, is there any way to even predict that? Like, who do you think that one of these guys, like who would break through, who might not break through? It's just kind of tragic knowing that a lot of these guys will end up having a career like Matt Ryan, which is great, but ultimately falls a little short of the main goal. Yeah. Like on the, on the one hand, you look at where the, the AFC in particular is right now. And, and you, you know, you, you went through the names, uh, Trevor Lawrence, Josh Allen, Lamar, uh, Burrow, Herbert, like the, the, this is, inc- this is an incredible collection of quarterbacking talent. Th- there's, they're not just going to take turns going to Super Bowls. They all have to get through Patrick Mahomes, right? Like right. The, the, that that doesn't end anytime soon. It, we, I remember talking about this when uh, when the Bengals made the Super Bowl, and it you know obviously it feels like oh geez this is you know so early in Burrow's career he's so great he's got it all ahead of him he's got he's got Chase he's got Higgins well when you get there there's an urgency to win it obviously because it's the pinnacle of the sport but also like there's no guarantee no matter how well you play no matter how many MVPs you win that you are getting back. It is it is just a loaded conference in particular, and uh, and and the league, you know, as as fans, it's a gift that there's like uh, you know ten a dozen quarterbacks that are that are really thrilling to watch week in and week out. Um, but it, I mean, the num- the numbers game is what it is, right? And, and I I think we would all put Patrick Mahomes at the at the top of the pyramid right now, um, and I I don't think anybody's going to knock him off. So. It, it's going to take a weird set of circumstances to get to get past him. So it's, I mean, it's not inconceivable that almost everybody you just mentioned, like maybe one or two guys break through, right? Like I, I don't know. Would can Justin Herbert win an MVP and never win a Super Bowl? Sure, um, he's mm-hmm. already thrown for five thousand yards, right? Like Joe Burrow's going to win an MVP or two because that is the kind of thing where players take turns, right? And that right. is is very much narrative driven. And we, we just, you know, start building a case for a guy at midseason and we don't see our way to anybody else. Um, that, that's how, you know, sometimes these things get decided before they should get decided. So, like, the MVPs are going to be spread around. I don't know that the Super Bowls are going to be spread around. Um, what does that do to everybody's Hall of Fame case, right? Like, I don't, like, uh, is Matt Ryan going to the Hall of Fame? Um, I don't, I don't, like, yeah, what, do you think he goes, like, right now, would you guess that he's a Hall of Famer? I mean, I, I feel like, first of all, I feel like winning an MVP puts you in the conversation, right? Like we have to talk about you as a serious candidate because at your peaks, you know, the, the people who cover the league decided that you were the best in the league. Um, and that, that means a lot. I think in the NBA, nobody who's, you know, Derek Rose may change this, but nobody who's ever won an MVP isn't in the hall of fame. It is, it is one of those things that like, once you've checked that box, we have to talk about you for the rest of time. And, And I think it should probably be true in the NFL as well. So there's going to be a case, obviously, that, you know, I don't I don't have his career yardage total in front of me, but it's it's up there. Right. <laughs> right. Like, oh, it's yeah. a, the it's yard, a the yard, you, like yardage totals are, are going to be like everybody's going to look like an insane Hall of Famer at this point, just because yeah, of the change yeah. of the era the last few years. And that's that's going to take decades to change. But you can't like, you know, nobody from the 70s, 80s, 90s can challenge those numbers. The, you know, the passing game has evolved to, to such an extent. So he's going to, he's going to have a, he's going to have a case. It may not be a great case. And we may ultimately decide that no, nobody's, you know, you're not getting in without a Super Bowl unless you have like just an absolutely out of time season on your resume, like Dan Marino or something like that. Right. Like you have to be an all time crazy talent. Um, and you know, he, he probably comes up just a little bit short, but an amazing career. And yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know which name or which names from the, the list of guys we've talked about are going to fall into that same bucket, but it's, it's going to be several. Going to be several. And you know, Anthony Richardson just drafted into the AFC Bryce young, or excuse me, CJ Stroud just drafted into the AFC. Like who's to say one, maybe even both of those guys is not in this same Herbert burrow, Jackson, Allen, Trevor Lawrence, like group of quarterbacks, you know, like in the next few years, that just makes it even more competitive and then increases the odds. I think that all of these guys or the vast majority of these guys end up having not even not even like a Matt Ryan career, like a Philip Rivers career. Again, I keep coming back to Philip Rivers because he never even went to a Super Bowl. Like, you know, it's just that's that's tough to stomach, but it's the reality of the position right now, even in the NFC. 
even in the NFC. Like I, I, I with Jalen Hurts last year, they go to the Super Bowl, and I think there's a temptation to be like, look, the Eagles have a great roster. They'll be back here a ton of times, but you just never know. You, you never know what's going to happen. Things change so quickly. I think the Burrow example is probably like I'm with you. I think he's the one that maybe you look at and because he went to a Super Bowl already, like he'll get one or he'll be back there or whatever. But that team is going to go under a ton of change the next few years, right? Because the, yeah. the Chase contract yeah. discussion, the, t- the Higgins contract discussion. And yeah, I think... If I had to guess right now, you know, Burroughs even talked about maybe taking less money to keep the team together. Maybe he does. Maybe he doesn't. Usually nobody ever does. But maybe they keep those three guys together. But then you got to start shaving on the margins on the defense that has mostly been built through free agency. Like Lou Anarumo is going to leave at some point, probably for a head coaching job. So it's just tough to sustain that. And then maybe you're looking at Burrow as a as a Matt Ryan type of guy with better, maybe better peaks. Maybe better, um, more more potential like pushes to be a Super Bowl quarterback, but you know never actually gets one. And and as great as Bro is, I think if you told people right now he'd be in that ninety eighth percentile of quarterbacks like Matt Ryan is, it'd be kind of a disappointment. But God, it's it's not. It's a really good career. Yeah, that's also like when when we talk about Burrow and and Josh Allen, like th- those teams are as as ready to win as you can be. Right. Like Cincinnati's had another good off season, right? They've got all this skill talent. They've got depth. Now they've got a defense. Now they've got like, you know, they've been to the conference title game a couple times. They've been to a super bowl. Like, man, that, that window is so open for them. Um, but again, on the flip side, you've got, you've got Patrick Mahomes and, and Travis Kelsey still there, like yeah. barring the door to the, <laughs> to the Super Bowl. It's just, again, it's a great time to be a fan. It is a tough time to be like in the conversation for the second best quarterback in the AFC. All right. Good talk on that. Even if it is a weird, weirdly like a little, I, I find it to be a little tragic to think about these guys and like how, <laughs> you know, I don't know. I'm going to, I'm going to tell my kids about how great Josh Allen was or whatever. And they're like, who's Josh, you know, who's Josh Allen. I mean, well, they'll, they'll probably be like, who's Josh Allen generally, but like, we don't remember him as a Super Bowl quarterback or whatever, anything like that. It's something a little bit tragic uh, to it. I mean, the consolation prize is that all of these guys will have had several seasons making 45 plus million dollars. Yeah. Right. 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 I mean, let me not overstate the the grand tragedy of this. I mean, I think (laughs) or anything like that, just as like a weird sentimental football fan, I find it to be a little tragic, but I think their bank accounts will, will be, will be all right for it. I think, I think that maybe that can make it up to them. I don't get, I I don't get any of that. All right. So uh, I can, (laughs) I can feel weirdly tragic about it, but all right, this is good discussion. I I do find it to be a fascinating one, but let's move into the meat of our podcast here today, Andy. So this is how this is going to work. Andy and I have both come up with our own lists of top five fresh start new beginning candidates. This was pretty open ended. Honestly, don't have a lot of clear guardrails here. You know, players, coaches, I mean, damn team mascots, whatever. I don't think anybody <laughs> picked the mascot, but I don't who, I don't really care. OK, this is, this is a May 18th podcast, baby. There are no rules to this. We're going to go back and forth, uh, see how each of our lists shakes out. If there's potentially any overlap. Andy, I came up with like 10 names just so we wouldn't overlap. But I'll mention if I have one of your guys on, on my list of 10. And let me tell you what, listeners, nobody loves an extremely confidential list podcast quite like Andy Barron. So I, we have no, no no idea what the other person is going to say. No idea who's on each other's ledger here. So, Andy, why don't you get us started with this one? Yeah, my favorite format for any podcast is the secret list where we each come up Love with it. our own list of names and and then mush them together. I, I will also say that I did not, you know, again, like no hard criteria for what this was going to be. So I basically just I just came up with a list of situations that I find really interesting. They are not necessarily the situations and we'll get to this in a second with my first name. They are not the situations that I think are going to have the most fantasy impact. They all just sort of involve teams or players who, uh, who I think are, are particularly interesting. Um, my first one, I wanted, uh, I wanted to go, I wanted to go tight end somewhere. Mm. Um, I damn near went Sam Laporta, but I figured it was probably weird to go with a rookie Sicko. here, but my God, <laughs> going from Iowa's offense last season to literally anywhere else, um, is so exciting for Sam. But again, I thought rookie was a little bit weird. Um, we probably needed an NFL veteran here. Um, so I'm going to get us I'm going to get us started with um, a name that is as big as they come. Irv Smith Jr. 
Um, <laughs> <laughs> when you were, when you were talking about the Bengals and like, oh, they've got, you know, depth. And I almost made like an Irv Smith crack there. So I'm glad I did it. And <laughs> I always say to you, Wait, hey, this is how you get the people listening in the offseason. Like, let's talk about new beginnings. Irv Smith. <laughs> Um, this, this is just the one, this is just a guy who, who fits sort of the classic, um, second contract tight end story, right? Like we, we see that all the time. It is a very slow developing position and, um, the, you know, uh, fantasy managers don't need to be told that there are all sorts of guys that hang out around the league for like four years doing nothing. We write them off as disappointments and, and then they have a monster season or three out of, out of seemingly nowhere. And again, that is because it is a, it is a notoriously slow developing position. Not, not everybody is, you know, Kittle, not everybody is Rob Gronkowski. Um, for the most part, mm-hmm. these guys take a little bit of time to ease into the league so but Smith covered in red flags, right? He only played eight games last year. None the year before that, right? Has to stay healthy. Um, did he lose his job to TJ Hawkinson? Yes, he did. Um, but like the, there are Irv Smith truthers out there, just as there used to be oh, yeah. Jared Cook truthers out there. Um, Irv has been the absolute unrivaled king of preseason hype over the last like <laughs> three, four years, right? Like yeah. there is always a story about Irv Smith really connecting with Kirk Cousins. He's going to be the red zone weapon. Finally, we've moved on from Kyle Rudolph. You know, they've solved the tight end position, whatever. He's a former second round pick. He's a proven red zone weapon, if nothing else. And right now, he is also pretty clearly the number one receiving tight end for the Cincinnati Bengals. That is a verifiably good team that is probably going to average close to 30 points per game. Um, you know, signed a, signed a one year low dollar prove it type of deal. It's not like the team is locked into anything. Um, but th- this was pretty clearly a terrific flyer for Cincinnati. And he fits the, you know, if what we're talking about here are guys who just desperately needed a new beginning and they landed in a great spot to produce, if they have anything um, to to give us, um, that that is exactly what this is. Irv Smith definitely like the weirdly young Hall of Fame All Stars list as well. Uh, he'll turn twenty five <laughs> yeah. in August, even though he's played four years in the NFL, missed an entire year due to injuries. Injuries have been. Um, a theme of his career so far. His best season was uh, 2020 or 2020. Uh, five touchdowns, you know, 8.5 yards per target. But again, he only played 13 games that year, he played eight games last year. And yeah, you're right. His the team that he was on, not the regime that drafted him. So that that is something to take yeah. in there. They actively went out and were like, we're not only going to replace you, we're going to like take big assets and get somebody that we think is a clear upgrade. And frankly, TJ Hawkinson, you know, one of your Iowa guys was a huge upgrade. But I, we just talked about in the you know tr- quote tragic quarterback section that the Bengals have to like work on the margins at some positions because yeah. they're going to be so overweight at wide receiver at quarterback in the terms of the contract soon. You know, like Tyler Boyd's making ten million dollars this year. Like he ain't making ten million dollars. Like the slot receivers <laughs> not making ten million dollars on the Bengals going forward if they extend Higgins and Chase, which I do think they probably will. Um, so the tight end. Like I, they just did this with Hayden Hurst last year and Hayden Hurst didn't have like any crazy special season or whatever, but he gave you a couple moments in fantasy. He was like a reliable starting tight end on his, on his third team, not even his second team. Like I kind of think the Joe Burrow tight end rehabilitation house might be like a thing <laughs> for these young athletic guys who didn't hit early in their career. Um, and Irv Smith, I uh, actually Hayden Hurst was like weirdly old when he was drafted. Whereas like Irv Smith was weirdly young when he was drafted, but the point remains the same. Yeah. Um, I, I just think it's a, I, again, this, you know, he, he could not be in the league in a year, right? <laughs> right. Like this could be, this could be the final stop for Irv Smith. I totally get it. Um, he, he's just a guy that the league thought a lot of at one point. Um, he, he's had some moments and this is just a, this is just a great spot to prove himself. Yep. Uh, definitely possible. And Hey, look, everybody is thirsty for uh, tight ends. So I think that's perfectly fine. You know, I think that's a good one. Okay, I'm going to go a little bit bigger name for my first one. Uh, And this guy's not in a new place, but I do think he's at a potential new beginning of his career. And that's Cleveland Browns running back Nick Chubb. Um, I think people forget. Look, Nick Chubb's one of the best running backs in the NFL. I think when you talk about like 
best pure runners in football, Nick Chubb's name's going to get brought up. He doesn't have the same passing down equity as like a Austin Eckler or a uh, you know Christian McCaffrey that we covet so much in fantasy. But I think people forget that this is basically, I don't even think it's basically, I think it's this is the first year we're going to get Nick Chubb like completely unchallenged in his own mm-hmm. backfield. You know, as a rookie, there was Carlos Hyde. Uh, Carlos Hyde, you know, Hugh Jackson famously started him off as, as the starting back for like probably the first, almost the entire first half of the season. Um, Nick Chubb was one of those guys, Andy, that I always rail. And I think people are, are actually sharper about this now than they were even in like 2018 or whenever Chubb was drafted when it was like, I'm going to draft this rookie running back way too high. And then I'm going to end up dropping him and somebody else is going to take him and win their league with him. (laughs) Um, People are a little bit sharper about that now, but Chubb was that classic dude where like he was going to take forever. Yeah. Not nothing to his own fault, but he was going to take forever to unseat the veteran ahead of him. So there was that as rookie year. And then obviously Kareem Hunt's been in the backfield. I think pretty much ever I think he joined in 2019, if I if I'm not mistaken, but Hunt's gone. I don't think he's getting re-signed by this team. The number two running back on the team is like Jerome Ford. So I know there's a lot of talk about the Browns offense. You know, they add Elijah Moore. They add Cedric Tillman uh, to a receiving core that already features Amari Cooper and Donovan Peoples Jones. They have one of these like breakout second contract tight ends that they drafted and extended in David and Joku. So we have Deshaun Watson. We're going to open the passing game up, but that can also be really good news for Nick Chubb too. Like I think we could be sitting uh, on the precipice of Nick Chubb's best season in the NFL. And he's already been a great player. Like Andy, I think he's a good candidate to lead the NFL in rushing. I think he's a candidate to lead the NFL in yards per carry and potentially like what's, uh, what's the most touchdowns Nick Chubb has scored in his career. I think there's a chance we could see him score the most touchdowns he ever has in his career. And I I feel like he's probably a guy that is probably not going to go in the first round of fantasy drafts, but I wouldn't be surprised if he is, you know, a candidate to be a top three finisher at the position this year. So I think it's kind of a new beginning for Nick Chubb. Yeah. Given, given how much we have to assume he's going to be, he's going to be on the field. Um, like, can we just get to, can we just get to 40 catches for Nick Chubb? Cause if we can get to 40 catches for Nick Chubb, that's we're now, now we're challenging 2000 scrimmage yards, right now. Now we're talking about somebody who has a profile that can, that can ultimately finish as the overall RB one. Um, it is hard to believe that we're not going to see Nick Chubb win multiple rushing titles, you know, like that, yep, that, never that would kind of blow me away. I mean, he's, he's coming off 1500 yard season with a dozen touchdowns and he was kind of on fumes at the end, right? He was playing through an injury, um, and, and toughed it out in, you know, in the closing weeks of the season. Uh, he's, he's never not averaged five yards per carry, right? Like I, I feel like there have been a handful of conversations over the years. Maybe, maybe, you know, people go down, uh, you know, uh, Twitter uh, rabbit holes and start talking about the number of big plays he's had. And well, if you take those out, then he only averages that. But like the yeah, guy okay. breaks <laughs> off big plays consistently, like his whole career, it's who he is. He's always done it. He did, he did it in college. He's done it every year in the NFL. Um, he's, uh, you know, he, he's, I think he's one of the most remarkable runners of, uh, you know, certainly of, of this era. It's going to be weird if he never wins a rushing title. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't think it's difficult to imagine like 1,650 yards, 1,700 rushing yards. You know, again, if he can just get to 35, 40 catches, Now he's at 2000 scrimmage yards and, um, it's not, you know, like this offense, I kind of want to just tie this into my next name because my, the next name on my list is Elijah Moore, who, um, (laughs) you know, talk about a guy who needed a new beginning. Um, you know, that, that obviously this whole offense is going to come down to like whether Deshaun Watson is, whether he can ever get back to like being, you know, 2019, 2020 Deshaun Watson. If that happens, Okay, now we have another, you know, elite quarterback in the AFC, which is just wild. Um, Now we've got an offense that should put 28 on everybody. Now we've got an offense that can produce like a 20 touchdown score out of the backfield. That could be Nick Chubb. So, again, there's a there's a path for him to be the overall RB one. I don't, you know, nobody's going to rank it that way, but it's but it's certainly in play. It is a it is a clear possibility. I will we'll go to Elijah Moore next because uh, he was obviously a candidate uh, f- for my list as well. But I kind of had a feeling you would you would name him. And I've talked so much about Elijah Moore that it's like kind of OK, we get it. But um, sticking on Nick Chubb for a second. Yeah, he's 
a 5.2 yards per carry average for his career. He is one of the most explosive runners in the NFL career high, 12 touchdowns. Like I could definitely see him getting, you know, some, some kind of crazy touchdown ceiling for sure. 15 uh, last year was actually the, his career high in rushing yards, which I think probably would surprise people, but a career high 302 carries. Like I think he could easily beat that. He's right now in early sicko best ball drafts. He's the RB (laughs) six. Um, he is, but he's the 21st overall player off the board. Again, I think that's at the overall ADP he could beat, but just little this or that with you at the running back position, Andy, I, I assume you take McCaffrey or you would rank McCaffrey Eckler over, uh, Chubb this year, right? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a pretty long time Nick Chubb guy. Um, right. Like had a lot of him last year, which, which for the first half of the season, that was just clearly one of the right answers in fantasy. Right. And then he started playing through injuries and he wasn't quite as productive. Um, I don't have many guys ahead of Nick Chubb, I, but I like, I do have Bijan in that group. Like, okay. I, I mean, I would take Nick Chubb over Saquon Barkley. I know I don't see it very often, but I would take Nick Chubb over Saquon Barkley. Um, I don't like, I, th- I think both of the offenses have reasonable questions. Um, I think Nick Chubb is every bit as good. He's obviously not the receiving threat that Saquon is. I just, I just think Nick Chubb is one of the best, if not the best, uh, like pure rusher in the game. Um, I, I love him. So yeah, as the RB five as the RB six, I, I think that's totally fine. Over, how about Jonathan Taylor, Derrick Henry, your boy Josh Jacobs, Tony I have Pollard, him over, over all Henry. those guys? I don't have him over, I don't have him over Bijan, um, which is <laughs> j- just my current infatuation with Bijan, I guess. Um, I don't enough. have him over Eckler, McCaffrey, or Taylor, and that's it. Yeah, I, I think that, again, we're thinking, I, I, I could totally see the argument for Chubb over Jonathan Taylor, just because I think mm-hmm. Anthony Richardson will be a bigger touchdown threat to Taylor. And I think that offense is probably going to be less uh, as high as I am on the Colts. And I am high on the Colts offense long term. I think this year, the Browns offense will probably be better. So I feel like Chubb's touchdown equity. So yeah, I, like we're talking like running back four, running back five. And I guarantee you when we come to, when we get to August, Chubb is not going to be ranked or drafted as mostly the running back four or five. So uh, that is an interesting one there, but yeah. let's move to Elijah Moore in the same offense. Again, I could talk for days about Elijah Moore, <laughs> but I want to hear what you have to say. Yeah, right. Right now, he's just you know he's just kind of this, and he's he's been this way for for the last you know couple seasons. He, he's just an idea, right? He's mm-hmm. he's just he's just this enigma. Um, to, absolutely terrific receiver over multiple seasons at Ole Miss. I don't need to tell people that. Um, his his first year with the Jets, full of promise. Um, six touchdowns, right? A um, lot a lot of flashes of of big playability, and then just. You know, he's a, he's an easy early separator. Um, he, he's a guy who absolutely flashes when you're, when you, when you were watching some pretty dreadful Jets games a couple of years ago, um, <laughs> yeah. you'd really see something with Elijah Moore and then just a disaster uh, of a season in year two in New York. Um, uh, really kind of unable to get looks, even when his quarterback was dropping back like 50 or 60 times as you know, Joe Flacco occasionally did as Mike White occasionally did. Um, the, the QB play was terrible. Um, but like Moore did not handle adversity. Well, it's not as if it's not as if none of this is on him, right? Like, um, th- things, things went bad and we all heard about it and it became a huge story. Um, he, he's just received an amazing early career bailout that did not have to happen. And he's lucky that it did happen. Um, I think I think ultimately this the situation might be as simple as he he's going to blow up if Deshaun Watson gets back to being who he was. You know, um, if we get like that forty eight hundred yard version of Deshaun Watson and he's throwing thirty touchdown passes, then we're going to get eighty to ninety receptions from Elijah Moore, and he's going to be a threat for a thousand yards and like eight touchdowns, um, maybe more. The version of Watson that we saw like three or four years ago fully capable of delivering two, maybe three viable fantasy receivers. More is more is just in perfect position to be that guy. Like it can't just be Amari Cooper. Um, I think, I think the way that these, these uh, Browns receivers complement each other is like, I think it's a very well-designed receiving core. Um, I think there's a lot to be enthusiastic about in this, in this offense. And this is just an incredible opportunity that Moore has ahead of him. Yeah. Look, nobody can defend, 
uh, what he like making a scene in the middle of a winning streak last year. Yeah. Uh, even I stupid, stupid move. You know, you sh- shouldn't have done that. Uh, and I'm not saying it was a smart thing to do, but I understand why he was pissed at the time because you look at him and he's like, I'm sure people are listening to this and people have thought like, why are you talking so much about Elijah Moore? This is the guy who hasn't had more than 600 yards in either of his first two seasons, but he's definitely a, you've got to watch the player in isolation. You know, you've got, which is obviously what I do with reception perception. He's got, you've got to do that with this guy. And like his rookie season was fantastic. Like, he cleared 75% success rate versus man. He cleared 80% success rate versus zone. Like those are the two indicators you want to see for like, not just breakout players, but like guys just in reception perception, who clear 75% success rate versus man. Like other than, you know, Curtis Samuel, they're all like the stars of the, and Sterling Shepard injuries. Leave me alone. They're all like the stars <laughs> of the league. Other than, other than those two guys, you get over that benchmark. Like you're some of the best receivers in the NFL. He dipped a little bit in his second year because I think he was maybe not going full balls to the walls at at some points during the season, Um, but still not in a really dreadful way. It's very similar to me to like Brandon Ayuk, who in his second season Mm. obviously got into a a lot. Of course, another guy that I was so in on going into his second season. Um, I don't know. I don't know why I'm on that trend this year. Uh, Let me pick the guy who let me pick the guy who loves to get in fights with his team. But regardless, like (laughs) Brandon Ayuk had a similar situation his second year. He also dipped from 75.7% success rate versus man to 71% in his second season, but that didn't stop his eventual third year breakout. I think Elijah Moore coming into this situation. I agree with you. It's perfect. It's a perfect spot for him. And nobody's going to, nobody's going to draft this guy high in fantasy this year. So like if you believe in the talent and also I think you have to believe in like a new beginning overall for the Browns offense in that, like they're going to leave some of that cookie cutter Baker Mayfield play the offense in a box, like be very run heavy. If you think they're going to leave that behind, I think you can be in on these receivers a little more than we have been previously. All right. My next one here, Andy's done two. I've done one. We're 40 minutes to the podcast. Great stuff. Uh, (laughs) My, my, uh, my second one here, and and it's a little bit of a twofer. It's Alexander Madison and Dalvin cook. This is a story we haven't talked about on the podcast because I've been like, okay, it's not really a real news item yet. Let's talk about when it happens, but it fits for this, uh, this group here, I think it's been plain all off season that the Vikings want to, and eventually when it works contractually or, you know, uh, the uh, Dalvin cooks had an injury situation like that. He like a, another shoulder thing that he's been dealing with or a trade partner emerges. I think it's been clear all off season. They want to move on from Dalvin cook. They re-sign Alexander Madison to a decent deal at the beginning of free agency. I think right now, and, and a couple of people, I think Ian Harditz was one of them, pointed it out that the Vikings on their Twitter profile right now, Andy, uh, have the banner out there. And Alexander Madison has replaced Dalvin Cook on the Twitter ba- banner uh, of the Minnesota Vikings. So, um, yeah, I think Ian Harditz from Fantasy Life was the one that pointed that out. So I, I think I think it's pretty clear, like Alexander Madison is probably going to be the starting back for the Vikings and Dalvin Cook will probably be elsewhere. You know, Madison's a guy that we've seen fill in for Dalvin Cook over the years and been really productive when he does have those fill in moments. And obviously Cook didn't have his best season last year, but like he's definitely going to, you know, I mean, I I guess I think he's going to probably going to go to like Miami and ruin all the Devin A chain rookie drafters right now. (laughs) That's definitely a possibility. But I think both these guys are getting fresh starts cook will be I think elsewhere soon enough and Madison will be the unquestioned RB one for the Vikings so I'm curious Andy any thoughts on where cook might end up what what his new beginning will be like and for Alexander Madison it is a new beginning in Minnesota I'm wondering uh, like right now if you're drafting best ball drafts like this is probably the lowest you'll ever see Alexander Madison go because when this move eventually happens I think he should be a guy that goes in like the first five rounds of drafts with with cook uh removed from the situation and and no one you know l- let's just assume that anybody they add is not a, a serious threat to take a, a huge slice of the workload okay now we're talking about somebody who can fr- finish as a as a fringe rb1 right like alexander madison can be a top 10 running back top 12 running back if he's getting 270 plus touches right like i think he's I don't know. We've had the Alexander Madison conversation at some point uh, uh, over the years, like every season. He's 
he's something like 95% of Dalvin Cook. And that extra 5% is really exciting. And it's why Dalvin yeah. Cook gets paid. And it's, you know, it, there, it probably represents a couple hundred yards that Alexander Madison wouldn't come up with on his own. But he can find the end zone 10 times, 12 times. Um, he, he's, he, we've seen him deliver hundred yard games time and again when, when Dalvin cook is out. So yeah, that is a, that is a bankable player. He doesn't, he doesn't have some, uh, at least nothing that's leaping to mind. He doesn't have some problematic injury history that we should be worried about either. So yeah, M- Madison is going to be one of those guys who probably, um, if he has the backfield to himself should be going before the RB dead zone, right? Like I wouldn't, mm-hmm. I don't know if, if, if Alexander Madison is the clear number one running back for the Minnesota Vikings and somebody takes him in the third round, I'm not going to, I'm not going to bat an eye at that. Uh, I I ducked the question by the way of where Dalvin cook is going to go. Like I have no idea. You, you hear Miami all the time. Um, I, I feel like Miami is one of those teams that has figured out how to have a great running game with, um, some guys that are not particularly expensive. And hey, let's take a flyer on this explosive rookie who might get, you know, five to seven touches a game. And let's see what like I feel like they've actually put together a great running game on the cheap. So it would surprise me at some level to see them go Dalvin Cook. But that is the team that everyone talks about. Yeah, I mean, I think maybe people make that connection because like he was born in Florida. He went to Florida State. He went to high school in Miami Central. So like, I mean, there maybe that's why yeah. that connection is made. Maybe he wants to go. It's maybe similar to when Ezekiel Elliott, like the news story broke, like he wants to go to these three teams <laughs> and those three teams are like, no, thank you. We're, we're, we're all set. <laughs> we're all set on Zeke. Uh, so maybe that might be what the connection is because it is tough. Like, you know, I, um, I thought about Tony Pollard as a candidate for this list, Um, like for a guy that's about to get a new start. But I can't get out of my mind that like either Zeke goes back there. They sign Leonard Fournette. They sign Dalvin Cook. Like, yeah, producer Colin's going to start losing his mind in the chat in two seconds about me bringing any of this up. Uh, Colin can also chime in. He's got a mic over there. I'm just telling buddy. Yeah, I'm making my debut. I I was going to wait, but this this (laughs) has gone down a really egregious path there. So uh, I'm (laughs) I'm just telling you. As as the Cowboys fan, I can say wholeheartedly, Jerry Jones can say what he says. Stephen Jones, Mike McCarthy, that whole team, they're moving on. They they really do like Ronald Jones as that guy to replace that. Oh, Jesus. Short yardage. Hey, that's what they think. I'm I'm not saying one is right. I'm just saying what they're thinking. Who's to say Ronald Jones isn't next on my list? Right, exactly. I could oh, uh, well. No, and a smooth transition, Andy. If it is, <laughs> but but just for everyone yeah. listening, Zeke is not returning to Dallas anytime. They gave away his number. Stephon Gilmore wears that, and that's all you need to know. All right, carry on, guys. Fine, fine, fine. I agree with you. Maybe that's not the most likely one. Enjoy like Leonard Fournette in the Cowboys uniform, then like taking <laughs> carries away or Dalvin Cook. I guess that's more exciting. Maybe. Uh, I'm just te- I'm just saying like. And I appreciate hey, talk about talk about uh, Colin has left the chat. I'm talking about like, hey, th- talk about fresh starts here. New beginnings. Colin making his, his debut on the podcast. Shout out to shout out to Colin. But Colin did great work on the podcast, by the way. I'm, I'm only yeah. teasing about this Cowboys thing. But seriously, I, I can't get my out of my mind that like a Dalvin Cook or a Leonard Fournette joins this backfield with Tony Pollard. But yeah, so maybe that's a spot for Dalvin Cook. It's really hard to to slot these veteran running backs anywhere without an injury happening to some starter. So Cook is a tough guy to place. But all right, Andy. Give me your third candidate here. Uh, fresh start, new beginning. Um, my third candidate is uh, the first of the coaches on my list, and it's uh, it's Sean Payton. Um, mm. I, the, and obviously, this has been discussed to death in uh, prior episodes. But I, I just, I just think he's landed in a spot where, like, Sean Payton, first of all, has done. We associate him with Drew Brees and it's one of the greatest, you know, coach quarterback collaborations uh, in NFL history. It's certainly one of the defining collaborations of the most recent era in the NFL. Um, when you when you set that aside and you and you look at the small samples of work that that Peyton has done with other quarterbacks, it's really good. Right. Um the best seasons of Kerry Collins's career were with Sean Payton as his offensive coordinator a million years ago. Um, you, you think about, you know, late in Breeze's career when he would miss games, the the guys who would come in, you know, um, five and zero oh with Teddy Bridgewater, like five and two with Jameis Winston, right? Winston putting up whatever it was, 14 touchdown passes and like two or three interceptions, like really good work. The, the, 
the weird wins that uh, they would cobble together with Taysom Hill at, at quarterback. Mm-hmm. Like Sean Payton's work with some with some sketchy QBs is really impressive over the years. And obviously, when you give him an inner circle Hall of Fame quarterback who's one of the most accurate passers in NFL history, it, you know, they win a Super Bowl. It's 5,000 yard seasons. They're one of the most dynamic offenses in the NFL forever. Obviously, we're talking about a, a coach with a, with a distinguished resume. I can't help but think that if you let Sean Payton handpick his quarterback for a team that he was just sort of airdropped into... Like his top 10 choices, none of them are Russell Wilson. Um, <laughs> it just, it's just, yeah. it's just so not the guy that he, you know, he had the biggest success of his career with, right? Like there's just, other than height, there are not a lot of similarities between what Drew Brees was as a quarterback and what Russell Wilson has been as a quarterback, even in his best years. And certainly not now. Um, be- so, even though Russell Wilson thinks like that's his North star. Yes, like, I am. A, yes. like, that was the whole problem at the end of the Seattle run and in this Denver run is that he thinks like, I'm going to run empty. I'm going to run quick game. I'm Drew Brees, but he's just, he's not you. Uh, yeah. And he's uh, listen, it's not even a knock. Like, first of all, not many people are Drew Brees. Um, so, like he's had his greatest success, you know, just launching deep and, and sort of, uh, you know, trophy hunting and, and, he, and he's been great. Like he's been great at it. Obviously he's had a, a phenomenal career and his, his best seasons are, are remarkable seasons. He's been terrific. Um, he's got a level of mobility that Bree's never had, although he hasn't really shown it much in the last two mm-hmm. years. Um, I, I just, I just think this is a, a super interesting collaboration, but we've seen Sean Payton have fantastic success with um, flawed quarterbacks or, or quarterbacks who are, you know, like the whole grab bag of quarterbacking types, we've seen Sean Payton have some success with them. So I'm super interested to see what this looks like with Russell Wilson and a receiving core that we've probably all over maybe except you, everybody else is overrated <laughs> at some point. Um, right. It's not, it's not a great group. You look at their off season though. Their off season is really good. They've sort of built a wall around Russell Wilson and maybe what they're doing actually is, is, you know, building out this great offensive line so they can run some Ajay P Ryan for the first, four weeks and then Javante Williams thereafter. Right. And, and be a, a run heavy team. I have no idea. Like I I'm kind of excited that I have no idea what the Denver Broncos are going to be coming into this season, but they have a pretty serious coach who has done remarkable things with, um, some kind of icky quarterbacks over the years. And I'm, I'm really interesting. I'm really interested to see where this goes with Wilson. For what Sean Payton wants, you know, to be the football czar and to really be in like, you know, I, can't, I really think it's like a can't lose situation for Sean Payton. Like it's the mm-hmm. freshest of fresh starts, the be- the most beautiful of the new beginnings. Like I hope that my life transition goes as smoothly as Sean Payton's <laughs> has, has here that he, you know, dips out on the Saints at the exact right time. Everybody knows what he's going to do. He's going to go to another team the next year. And it happens exactly like that. And he gets paid, you know, probably more money than God by the Walmart people. Again, I can only hope that my life goes, my new transition goes as smoothly as Sean Payton because I really do think he's in a can't lose situation here. Like if he rehabilitates Russell Wilson, great. If he decides five weeks into the season, this is not working out. Nobody cares. Like nobody's going to blame Sean Payton for not being able to fix Russell Wilson. He was already too far gone. So you know what? I'm going to sit Russell Wilson. And like they did give Jarrett Stidham a decent amount of money quite quickly in free agency. So I think like he might have a Stidham little infatuation that he can explore in the last couple months of the season. And then, you know what? We're start really starting fresh next year. We're going to eat the dead money. I mean, and by we, I mean, you Walmart folks are going to eat the dead money. Uh, This guy's going to get out of here. Russell Wilson. I'm going to bring in whoever is my own. You know, let's Sean Payton will go in there to George Payton and say, you know what? We're making a crazy ass trade up to the top of the draft and we're getting Drake May or we're getting Caleb Williams. God forbid, you know, like that's what's going to happen next year. This is this is a great start for Sean Payton. Like and they've already shown, I think, that they have no commitment to to Wilson. Those receivers that you mentioned, it's like they have names there. Cortland Sutton, Tim Patrick, Jerry, Judy. What's the first thing they do in the draft? They trade up for Sean Payton's guy, Marvin Mims. So like yeah. this whole thing is basically going to be built in Payton's vision. And I'm glad you brought up the multiple quarterback thing. I would also say that Payton's a guy whose system has been a little like uh, malleable over the years. We think of it as the quick strike. Michael Thomas is catching a billion passes on short routes with Drew Brees's dead arm the last couple of years. But those first few years in New Orleans, they were running the ball really well, like you mentioned, and they were pushing it 
pushing it down the field vertically on play action, which I think will probably be the blueprint here early in Sean Payton's run. So I love, I, look, I love, he's perfect for this list, Andy. That's a perfect name because he is getting the freshest of fresh start. I'll give you another one here. Let's go. You know what? Let's let's stay uh, in your neck of the woods, pal. And let's just talk about DJ Moore, mostly because I want to pick your brain here on DJ Moore. Um, I'm writing a piece for the site today. It's due today. Haven't started it. Classic. Uh, <laughs> it's about wide receivers entering or exiting the quarterback wilderness. I basically created a third group, which was guys that are still stuck in the quarterback wilderness dot 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 for now. DJ Moore is like. I think there's an, a reaction of like, all right, he's about to get with the best quarterback he's ever played with, which is a low bar, by the way, for DJ Moore. Okay, we're talking about, yeah. you know, Cam Newton version 3.0, not even not even like the initial version of Cam Newton. I'm talking about when he got back to Carolina after going to New England. You know, it's Sam Darnold, it's Teddy Bridgewater, it's Baker Mayfield. You, you know, Will Greer got in there for a hot minute. You know the names <laughs> with DJ Moore. Is Justin Fields going to be good enough to get him out of the quarterback wilderness, Andy? I'm asking somebody who I know is totally objective on this one. But you know, for, <laughs> in terms of a fresh start, getting paired with a young quarterback, I think it's certainly a really good spot for DJ Moore if he's going to get out of the um, quarterback wilderness here. Yeah, so I I didn't put him on my list in in large part because I'm not sure, like... This isn't this isn't like the Elijah Moore situation where he's just sort of dropped into into the almost the perfect set of circumstances for him. Um, DJ Moore left a you know a, a, an environment that was that was pretty dreadful for even a number one receiver, and he is he's moving to a team that. Um, they they averaged 22 pass attempts per game last year. Right? Like, yeah, like tw- uh, it was like 22.2 pass attempts per game. Um, Sh- like a shockingly low number, an unserious number. Um, uh, uh, this is just something that we, that is not appropriate to this era. It might've been appropriate in 19, literally might've been appropriate in 1975. <laughs> not appropriate. Not Definitely appropriate not. is a great way to say it. <laughs> this is just not how you win games. They are not going to win games. Uh, they did not win games throwing the ball 22 times per week. Um, so that has to change so dramatically for this to be like a super exciting new beginning for DJ Moore. Um, I I think without question, the, the bears offense, you you look at what they've done on the, on the offensive line. That is, it's hard to imagine that offensive line, the the way they've rebuilt it, isn't at least going to be sort of league average, um, which, you know, that, that should be plenty for a good quarterback. Um, you know, Justin Fields might be the best quarterback that DJ Moore has, has played with, but that's more an indictment of the other quarterbacks that he's played with. And it's also like Justin Fields uh, achieves his status of good quarterback through a really uh, unusual set of traits, right? It's not, it's not yeah. entirely, um, his arm is great. Like he can, he can throw it anywhere on the field. And like, I, I still, I would still maintain that his, his best throws are, are absolutely beautiful. And some of the, some of the best that we've seen from anybody in his draft class, um, you know, does he, does he repeat it? Does he avoid mistakes? Does he, you know, no, he's not, he's not there yet. Right. So like Justin Fields still has a lot of development to do as a passer. He obviously can't take 55 seconds sacks again, again, like leading the league in sacks on a team that only drops back like 25 times a game is just, it's wild. It's absolutely wild. So he, he's got a lot of improvement ahead of him. We hope, um, the, but, but more, this is, this is about the run pass mix having to change so dramatically that I'm, I'm not sure it's such an exciting, fresh new start for DJ Moore, And, and there's a possibility that it's a little bit more the same for DJ Moore. Like, I, I don't know. I've got more, I've always loved more, Lo- loved him at Maryland when he was, you talk about sketchy quarterbacks, like his, um, oh, you yeah. know, the l- late days, uh, it, at Maryland, it just got worse and worse each week. Um, I, I've always liked him. I've got him in dynasty leagues and I can't, I can't say that I was, you know, I listen, I cheer for the bears. I'm happy to have DJ Moore with the bears. That was one of my off season priorities before it happened. Um, I can't say that fantasy wise, it's this exciting new landing spot for him. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I do think that I've said DJ Moore can help Justin Fields in two areas where like he's great on those over the middle, like slant routes, dig routes, mm-hmm. stuff like that. That's probably where he was best and most underutilized with the Carolina Panthers in the Matt rule era, particularly. I think he can obviously get 
like nobody has been given Justin Fields layups since he's been with the Chicago Bears. He yes. can definitely do yes. that. That's obviously true. But also like Moore's one of his best seasons as an individual player was 2020 when he was like a vertical X receiver for the uh, Carolina Panthers. Only 118 targets that year. The year before it was 135. The year after it was 163. I don't think he's sniffing anything even like remotely close to 163 with the Chicago Bears, but 18 yards per catch that year. Again, vertical X receiver. That's probably where DJ Moore fits best. And I think where he can really unlock Justin Fields there. So I think we're a little mixed. Like it's definitely a new beginning for DJ Moore, whether it's like a fresh start or just another new start. That's what will be the interesting question that we answer this season. Uh, all right, Andy, we got f- two more to go, each of us. So you give me one. We'll go a little more rapid fire on these. Give me your fourth guy here. I don't even I don't even have a specific player or coach. We could make this about Odell Beckham. We could make this about Todd Munkin. We could make this about the Lamar Ravens. Jackson. <laughs> I just want to generally talk about the Ravens, right? Um, I like I don't know if we if we pin it to Beckham, like I don't even pretend I'm not going to pretend to know what uh, Beckham has left at 30 coming off multiple ACL surgeries, right? It's just a terrible combination of age and history. Um, but I will say that when last we saw him, like that half season with the Rams was really good, uh, caught five touchdowns in his final seven games, had a nearly flawless postseason right up until the injury in the Super Bowl. Um, so like our last look at Odell was very favorable. Um, he is joining a receiving room that has a bunch of other question marks. Um, uh, we think we're enthusiastic about rookies, a flowers. Um, I think there's still something there with Rashad Bateman. Um, they've got a tight end at the top of the receiving pyramid. Um, that I more, I want to talk about this team because you, you know, as we start talking about these names, they had Beckham, they had flowers. Um, they had Todd Munkin. Uh, uh, like the, of late, the offensive coordinator for the Georgia Bulldogs, that's a pretty good resume item. Previously, you know, he was the OC um, in Tampa, like in that magical season of a super fun fantasy season with Jameis oh, yeah. and Ryan Fitzpatrick, right? Where they combined for like 5,300 passing yards, a million interceptions, a million and a half touchdowns, like uh, f- fantasy wise, <laughs> super fun. Um, and, and more to the point, they were throwing the ball 600 plus times a year. Um, so I, Everything that Baltimore has done in their offseason suggests they they want to throw it a lot, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? And, and that's that's exactly who they have not been. Um, Lamar obviously seems fully on board with that. When you when you think about those Bucks offenses, like they were they were driving the ball downfield. That's Lamar's game. Um, so it's not that difficult to sort of you know uh, I don't know daydream about Lamar Jackson having like a four thousand yard. 800 rushing yard, 900 rushing yard season. Um, and that it's really difficult. If he actually does something like that, that, I mean, that's going to be the QB one. Oh my God. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I, I, this is a great one for us to go rapid fire on. Cause I've, I've said this, I talked about the Ravens so much in the podcast lately that I don't need to belabor the point, but I, I, everything that Andy just said, take that to heart. And again, let this be the last few moments that you ever think about the Ravens as the Greg Roman Ravens. Okay. Yes. Like, yeah. That's over. Whether this works or not is a separate discussion, but that era of Ravens football, I think, is over. They're going to keep some of the quarterback run stuff. Monken did quarterback run stuff with damn Stetson Bennett at Georgia, okay? (laughs) But regardless, it's a new era for the Baltimore Ravens. That's for sure. Uh, It's definitely, I think it's time for a fresh start for Baltimore, and I'm very excited about it. Um, Another player, look, we've, again, a guy I've talked about on the podcast before, but I think if we're talking about fresh starts and new beginnings, you have to talk about Calvin Ridley. Um, Talk about a guy... I think what you said about Elijah Moore, 10 X that for Calvin Ridley, like, you know, the mental health break obviously was one thing. The gambling stuff probably shouldn't have done that, buddy. I, I, I know this is not a popular take, um, but I'm sorry. I have no sympathy for the dudes like, you know, Calvin Ridley or Jamison Williams who get banged for gambling. It's just, it's too easy to not get banged doing it. Okay. It's the first thing they tell you. I have no sympathy. That is my Andy. That's my most like, crusty old man take is everybody on Twitter, <laughs> you know, the moment Jamison Williams gets suspended, like the NFL's hypocrisy. How could they do that? That all might be true. It, I keep thinking of uh, the, have you seen the movie liar, liar with Jim Carrey, <laughs> Yes. you know, when he, the phone, when he goes, stop breaking the law, 
and he says something else I won't say on the pod, especially in reference to human beings. Uh, don't stop breaking the law and like hangs up. That's my advice. Stop breaking the rules. Okay. The rules are the rules. Regardless, Calvin Ridley broke the rules and he gets like the softest of landing spots to, oh, we're just going to take you from, you know, what was a chaotic offense at times during his final moments in Atlanta, Matt Ryan on the decline, you know, Arthur Smith trying to bring in his system. We're going to take you from that and just plop you as Trevor Lawrence's number one receiver, most likely. The th- one thing this offense is needed, a vertical press man coverage separator. Oh, go be that guy. And it's hard to not. I look, I've said it uh, and uh, early when this happened, the moment the trade happened, like in the middle of the season last year on the pod at one point, I know I've said it since. I really want to try to not get too excited about Calvin Ridley in Jacksonville. I want to remain cautiously optimistic. <laughs> too late. I failed. We've made it to May. I'm too excited about Cal Ridley. I don't know where I'm going to end up ranking him and drafting him in fantasy, all that stuff, but the cautious optimism has been torn up and thrown to the wind. I'm I'm all in on this fresh start for Calvin Ridley. Yeah, I, I love this. And it's almost, you know, uh, it's a thing that you had to keep reminding yourself of, uh, uh, you know, over the over the last few months with uh, with Trevor Lawrence, like every time I rank him. Um, and I've got him uh, like a QB eight, something like that. Right. And uh, there's always like uh, that, that moment when you remember, Oh yeah, he's got Calvin Ridley now. And you like drag him up another, another slot. Like this is, this is such a ripe situation. Um, like a, like a, like a real coach, um, (laughs) you know, he's, he's joining a team with a, with a real offense, with a quarterback who made such strides last year of, you know, almost, you know, unlimited ability. Um, it is, it is not that difficult to imagine, especially 17 game season, you know, can Trevor Lawrence pass for 5,000 yards next year? Y- yeah, Hell sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if that happens, um, I, I, Calvin Ridley's getting back to 1400 yards. You know, we're, we're definitely seeing that. I'd, I'd take Calvin Ridley well ahead of like, we were just talking about DJ Moore. I'd take him well ahead of yep. DJ Moore. I don't think there's any, uh, you know, and this is kind of sight unseen, right? Like he hasn't literally hasn't been on a football field in a minute. Um, but when last we saw Calvin Ridley, great player, um, perfect, perfect fit here. Um, you know, easy to, pretty easy to imagine Calvin Ridley going for like 1400 and Christian Kirk still going for a thousand and uh, Evan Ingram still having a year and Trevor Lawrence making himself like a, like a fringy MVP candidate. Like everybody has to stay healthy for that to happen. But you know, this is, I, I just, I love it when a, when a good young ascending team doesn't like the, the Jags haven't made too many changes. They've, they've just made a couple of enhancements, like obvious enhancements along the way. Um, that, that is, that is just a really exciting mix that he's entering. So yeah, absolutely. I love this one. Easy group to root for easy guy to root for in Calvin Ridley too. Cause you know, the gambling stuff aside, it, you know, that it's a hell of a story for him to try to come back from, from everything. And, you know, especially like he had a, wrote a great article in the players tribune. I would encourage everybody to, to read. And, you know, he even said like he was injured most of that, like 2020 season when he had his best year. And I, I am glad you mentioned the DJ Moore thing at his peak, Calvin Ridley, better player than DJ Moore period, like hands yeah, down. So yeah. love it. All right, Andy, you give me your last guy. I'll give you my uh, last one. We'll get out of here. My last guy is, is, and, and this is a complicated conversation for a variety of reasons. It's Eric B in Washington. Um, Oh dude, my last, my last one is Washington commanders fans. So perfect. This is a great perfect. one. Great way to end perfect. it on. Um, this is, this is obviously not the new beginning that coach B deserves. Um, <laughs> I, I want, I want him to succeed in Washington so bad. Um, mm-hmm. I, like it is, it is shocking that he's in this situation, right? Like, um, just at a, at a time when both of the coordinators for the team that lost the Super Bowl got head coaching jobs. Um, you know, anyone who's ever been associated with anybody who's ever been in Sean McVay's orbit, right. Can level up and get a head coaching job regardless of age, regardless of tenure, any of that, um, all, like all sorts of former failed coaches can, can go sort of launder their reputations with like Nick Saban for a year or two and they get head coaching. Show. Like it's all, it's all good. Um, Eric B has had to take this obvious backward step in his career in order to maybe gain consideration as, as a head coach. Um, he is the only guy apparently who pays a penalty for having worked with great players and under a great head coach himself. Um, 
the, the, the guy's won two Super Bowls as an offensive coordinator. He's he's been to a third, uh, lost that one to Tom Brady. You know, that's a big club. Um, literally every year he's been the OC, they've made it at least to the AFC championship game. It is a it is a flawless resume. And if you're, you know, if you're, if you're an NFL front office, there is like one essential question that you have to ask yourself about a head coaching candidate. And that is, if we give this guy all the pieces, if we give him all the tools that he needs, can he go win the thing? And the answer to that is an emphatic yes with Eric Bieniemy. Mm-hmm. He's done it, right? Like um, Andy Reid raves about him. Um, Andy Reid's coaching tree is good, right? Like uh, John, John Harbaugh's on that. Doug Peterson's on that. Like Sean McDermott's part of that. Like it's not, there, there's no, that's not like a negative. I don't, right. I don't see the negatives here. I, I think we all understand why he hasn't been given the same opportunity that some, the, some really bland, uninteresting coaches have been given. Um, and I want him to succeed so bad. He's got, great receivers um he's also got a fifth round quarterback right who might be frisky who knows yeah Uh, we've only seen like a a game out of out of sam howell but man i would love to see eric bn me go to washington win 10 games with sam howell um (laughs) get to the playoffs have a top 10 nfl offense and and then and then let, let's hear, let's hear the next reason why he can't be a head coach. Is it because he couldn't get past the divisional round? Is it, you know, whatever. Um, I, I'm rooting for this guy so hard. Me too. Um, I, I think that in a weird way, if he does get Sam Howell to, you know, like a, even average, like solid starter, it is, I think, even if it's not right, people will look at it as a better a feather in his cap than, being the guy coordinating the offense for Patrick Mahomes along with Andy Reid. You know, I think he'll get that'll be even if even if Howell doesn't work, you have a very safe veteran in, in Jacoby Brissett to keep the ship sh- the ship steady. So I think that's like it's it's kind of a win-win situation for Eric Bieniemy in that way, especially now in light of the fact that and this is why Washington football period is my fifth and final new uh beginning fresh start. The Dan Snyder era the worst I think objectively the worst owner in professional sports and there's a lot of bad owners out there but I think Dan Snyder is you know villain number one in Washington and really in the entire NFL like if he wasn't villain number one he'd still be the owner of the Washington commanders and and like that's it but like look if you're a Washington fan you know, I grew, I grew up in, in Northern Virginia for most of my life. Like, you know, this I'm fr- spent my entire life in Virginia before moving out here to L.A. I'm moving back to Virginia now. I know so many Washington, tortured, tortured Washington fans. I grew up, I don't even know why I like the sport. I grew up watching terrible, terrible, <laughs> you know, Washington teams. Okay. And, and, and like now you can approach this. All of you out there can approach this team now with like a renewed sense of optimism. Like, even if the Sam Howell thing doesn't work, you're, you're going to start over next year. You know, maybe Rivera gets booted out by new ownership. You know, Biennemi hopefully gets a shot as a head coach. There's also a, a nightmare scenario, by the way, Andy, where Biennemi gets hired as a head coach. And this is not a nightmare situation, but Biennemi gets hired as a head coach next year. And your boy, Matt Nagy also gets his like immediately <laughs> one year with Patrick Mahomes. He gets his second chance because he's yep. the offensive coordinator in Kansas City now. But, you know, Biennemi moves on to greener pastures, whatever. So you start all fresh next year. You've got really fun like this. If Sam Howell is just fun, this offense is going to be cool to watch because Terry McLaurin is a top 10 receiver in the NFL. Don't at me. Stay out of my mentions about that. Jahan Dotson had an awesome underrated rookie year. Curtis Samuel's still a good player They're If they really think like this uh, is Rodriguez, right? The running back they drafted the sixth Mm -hmm. round. They said they had like a third round uh, grade on him. They're talking about maybe, hey, maybe Antonio Gibson can get back in the mix. Brian Robinson had a pretty nice rookie year. Like their offense is going to be fun. Their offensive line is pretty solid. You know, uh, the defense is still coming along there as well. Look, if you're a Washington fan, if you're invested in Washington football at all, maybe they even maybe they even go unbrand the commander's name. Josh Harris and the new owner and his ownership group, Magic Johnson's a part of it. He goes up there and says, we're not the damn commanders anymore. <laughs> maybe they even go back to Washington football, you know, Washington football so team. Why not? It's a complete fresh start for um, one of the iconic franchises in the league. And let me tell you what. My heart's up for sale. All right. I'm going back to going back to my home state. <laughs> I, I'm about equidistance 
uh, by the way, they're going to get out of Landover, Maryland. They're going to get out of FedEx Field. Like, team, the, the Virginia will want to do business with them. Washington will want to do business. The, the district want to do business with them. Maryland will want to do business with them. Now that Dan Snyder, we got him the hell up out of here. And I will, I will do business with Washington football too if they do this thing the right way. I am open for business. We're about equal distance between the current stadium and uh, Bank of America down there in Charlotte. So, hey, I, I'm, I'm open for business, Washington football. And, hey, this is a great, great time. Great time for yeah, the fan base. I just want to add, uh, jumping in here, a fellow dmv uh grew up in the area. Since Snyder has publicly decided to sell the team, there has been momentum by D.C. politicians to bring them back to RFK Stadium. And that's yeah, real. Which and would that be great. Was not, yeah, that wasn't happening. So I think... I think kudos, shout out to everything Matt said as a fellow DMV or Cowboy fan, but I'm happy for them. <laughs> <laughs> How can you not? I love that you put a positive spin on this because I'm just sort of mad on Coach Bianami's behalf. Um, and and I, y- you're right. Like this, this is a super exciting. I don't know. Like this is this is the very spirit that we were that we were seeking out in this episode, right? Like new beginnings that have a lot of promise um, that I, either a player, a team, a coach, whatever. Really interesting situation. It, it certainly feels like that. Well, without question, um, that is an ascending franchise just just by virtue of the ownership change. Um, and, and I like I, I really think there's a chance. There's so, there's so much talent there at the skill spots that hasn't been unlocked yet. Um, and, and you're so right to mention Dotson too. Like what a, what, what a Ugh. fun rookie season that was like, awesome. he takes a step and now you've got Terry McLaurin and like, uh, uh, you know, uh, an improved version of Jahan Dotson. Like it, this, this is a really interesting team. And, um, they have, again, I'll j- just say it about coach B um, but like he, he's one of the most credentialed, one of the most impressive, uh, OCs uh, like that we've seen period. Right. Like, uh, just absolutely impeccable resume um hope he succeeds yeah it's it, like eric the enemy taking the step down sort of to become the offensive coordinator for the dan snyder washington football <laughs> operation not great but eric the enemy yeah. a part of the whole the whole part of the whole fresh start for washington i think is much more in the spirit of the show well andy i appreciate you uh joining me for this episode it was a fun one um it was a good idea not my idea i'm pretty sure it was colin's idea because colin's uh, an awesome producer and i'm a middling podcast host uh so shout out to colin <laughs> for a great idea and andy shout out to you uh for for being the guest on this one i appreciate it buddy yeah, this was uh, this was a joy. We should we should recycle this next year. This is a really good idea. Oh, 100 percent. I mean, I'm not I'm never moving again in my entire life, but uh, we'll definitely <laughs> do, we'll definitely do this one uh, again. We'll definitely do this one again. Um, also, shout out to you guys, because I always make like the thumbnails before the podcast. And I made one with Aaron Rodgers, just assuming. So really, really impressive. That oh. we did this whole thing and not mention him. Shout out to you guys. I, yeah, can we I were, just say that's not a new beginning because that's like, I don't, I don't know what the comparison that would be like if like a, a, a big suburban cul-de-sac, let's call the families, the Rogers family and the Hackett family and the Lazard family and the Cobb family. If they just decided to move from their Midwestern cul-de-sac to like a New Jersey cul-de-sac together, it's, it's the same damn thing. I'm also I'm feeling a little attacked here because it's like I'm moving back to my home state, uh, my <laughs> to the to, not the place I grew up in, but uh, the the town where my like sister currently lives. My mom just got a second condo in, so <laughs> maybe I, <laughs> I'm leaving. I'm leaving a place that I've loved, but I got a little tired of. Uh, maybe I'm Aaron Rodgers, which <laughs> didn't didn't think that was how we were going to end the podcast. But Andy, now you kind of got me. You kind of got me thinking on that one. As as much as I loved seeing Aaron Rodgers as like this, uh, you know, tired old hippie at Madison Square Garden every damn night watching teams that he did not care about. Right. Like, I really enjoyed that. Um, that's been my favorite thing about the Aaron Rodgers in New York experience. But like this, they got the band back together. It's not much of a oh, new yeah. beginning. Literally. Yeah, no, it's not. They're, they're just moved into like a, a higher price neighborhood, basically. All right. That's going to do it for us. Listen. Shout out to LA. Okay. It's my official goodbye. Um, it's been a hell of a run. Uh, look, there, like I said, there are definitely things I got tired of living here. I'm ready. My wife and I are both ready for, for a new start elsewhere, but I, I had an awesome, almost, you know, almost decade here. It was a great time. I met lifelong friends. I met, <laughs> met my wife. We got peach, the second dog. So Charlie got a friend. We were now, but the boys are, I, Andy, I pull up this old picture of, uh, Charlie and I standing outside the U-Haul 
moving from Virginia <laughs> to to uh, I'll I'll tweet it out at some point. But it, like we both look, we both look much younger, uh, and now we're going <laughs> back with two with two California desert girls uh, all the way back to the East Coast. So uh, shout out to LA. I I it was a, it was a hell of a time. Got to, you know got my career started here. Got working at Yahoo. I love working at Yahoo. I love uh, Andy and all the boys and everybody that works here, man. So um, I'm very excited to be doing keep it, keeping this whole train going just in a different time zone, man. So I am very excited. As I mentioned at the top, while I'm moving across the country next week, fear not for the pod. Scott Pinowski and Dalton Del Don will hold down the fort with an episode dissecting Yahoo's staff's first redraft mock draft of the season. Yeah. It's never too early. I already cowered it out of the second overall pick. I'm sure they'll talk about it. I hate myself for not taking a wide receiver there, but they'll, they'll get into it. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'll be back June 1st in uh, what we're going to be calling the condo cast because I'm going to be in my mom's condo for a few weeks. That's right. Treviso Babe's own uh, Beverly will be uh, hosting me. Maybe we'll get her on the pod, Andy. Maybe we'll get her a, a little guest Have tag to. on the pod. Well, we've got to do that. Uh, but more importantly... We're going to be debuting a very exciting new series on the podcast as soon as I get back. Stay tuned. Until then, we're out.